वेलकम टुडे वी हैव द फर्स्ट ऑफ द फाइव लेक्चर्स दैट वी आर गोइंग टू हैव ऑल रिलेटेड टू हेल्थ एंड कंप्यूटिंग तो वी आर स्टार्टिंग ऑफ दिस सीरीज विद अ वेरी डिस्टिंग्विस्ड पर्सन विद प्रोफेसर सुमी हलाल यू कैन फाइंड आउट ऑल द डिटेल्स अबाउट हिम but uh, without going into all those details let me tell you something very interesting and exciting that uh, i found out about sumi number one he has been working on uh, improving your homes and uh, communities for quite some time he was at florida built the, uh, one of the earliest smart home uh, type of project there he started building that community and because of that university of lancaster stole him from florida imagine a person from florida going to weather in lancaster okay? <laughs> and, and they must have made him some uh, amazing offers and that's why what he is trying to do is to improve quality of life of people in uh, not only lancaster but every place else he has established a center for digital health and uh, digital health and quality of life uh, this is a very vibrant center they are building communities which will be completely uh, equipped with different types of sensors and different facilities so that you can navigate through their lifestyle and control different kinds of things and uh, in addition to this kind of things he has been very active internationally on uh, digital health scene he is trying to build a community in digital uh, health related areas uh, by pulling together researchers from uh, different countries and uh, different places and uh, that's the context in which uh, we met first time and all i can say is that i feel that i know him for about 100 years <laughs> but uh, the really i have known him for less than 2 years and that's uh, really amazing with that sumi please we really thanks so much for the introduction and related with the kind words uh, i am very honored to be here thank you very much for the invitation and i hope that uh, i deliver for 50 minutes that uh, perhaps add any value at all to what you all know um, so it's about digital health back to the future meaning we will look at what we have done in the past 20 years and see what did we do right what did we do wrong a lot of wrong things and uh, maybe what is the agenda for the future so it's uh, it's sharing past and a little bit of the future <coughs> would you like me to use the microphone or you hear me okay perfect so uh, we'll talk first about what is digital health because it means different things to different people um, and then focus on the two key goals of digital health that is universally kind of agreed upon then we move into uh, showing an example just any evidence at all that digital health actually works uh, and then we look back at the lessons i have several lessons to share with you and then i go back uh, to the future meaning setting the research agenda uh, moving forward and then i will finish off by giving a quick uh, overview of the research projects that my team is working on in lancaster university so um, digital health I can go through this slide in like you can define it as technology that uh, is in the pathway of many things disease discovery uh treatment a whole lot of things it has to do with personal health integration with uh integrating healthcare and social care system it is about enabling learning health system we can say all this but still will not resonate with us so to give you a better definition that might resonate i would like to define digital health to you uh by using an analogy with the evolution of computers so uh we had the main frame at, at some point that was a computer and the characteristic of the main frame is that you have to go to it to get anything done you have to go to the room and now you do computing that is the main frame and the past 50 years we have worked very hard on what you call electronic health record it took 50 years to create it and standardize it ending with a fire standard but the all this time we have been creating the main frame so where we are today in digital health is just the main frame because you still have to go to the doctor or the hospital or the clinic so anybody touch your record or so that your record is updated 
That's exactly where we are. And digital health could therefore become simply the continuation of that journey, moving forward into the personal computer, moving forward into the mobile computer, ubiquitous computing. That's exactly the remainder of the pathway of digital health. So we already started digital health journey 50 years ago, ending with electronic health record and what's called clinical decision support systems. But there are still that, that monstrous being, they are the mainframe. And digital health, if you want to ask me, well, how do you define digital health in layman term? It is just the ubiquitous computing of health, similar to how we evolve from computer. So with that uh, in mind, you can actually uh, sort of uh, give it additional meaning as you wish, because there really isn't any fixed definition that we have to all stick to. The key digital health aim is basically to change the way we, we, uh, we get treated and we live healthy. <coughs> uh, so basically moving from a point of care paradigm. We live uh, in an unguided way and then we croak down, we go to the doctor or the hospital, we get <coughs> treatment and we move on to continue on whatever lifestyle we wish to, have, to pursue. That's how we live. And uh, that point of care paradigm, it, you would think it's too discreet, too sparse, but it's actually too expensive and too non-sustainable even though it's a point of care. In fact, if we care for you continuously, if we move into a continuum of care instead of a point of care, we actually can do better and be more sustainable and cut costs and give you better health outcome and quality of life. So that is the goal, is to move into a continuum of care. And as we do this, do it in a personalized way. And as we do this, get that side effect coming out of that continuum of care, which is data. Data for everybody, for the, the patient themselves, for the end user, uh, for the uh, 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 local authority to do population health, to understand what's going on, and to the government and so forth. So that's really a key element in digital health, is to just change the way we interact with the health system. So everybody knows this chart, uh, and it's about the determinants of health. What really, uh, what really determine how healthy you are? It's not the doctor you go to. In fact, that medical care is only 11%. If you go to the wrong doctor, well, it's not totally the wrong doctor, but if you go to a, a good doctor or not so good doctor, or you don't go to the doctor, that's 11% of your health uh, being, you know, your, 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 your well-being and your health is just 11% medical care. 22% is genetics. We cannot change it. Or maybe we can, but that's dangerous. Okay. Uh, but look at this. Individual behavior, 36%. Social circumstances, 24%. That's a whooping 60%. I mean, this is a low-hanging fruit. If we try to do anything in digital health, let's actually start with these simple things, behavior and the social circumstances, the community you live in, who you are associated with, um, and all that stuff. So uh, it is, it's not too difficult to figure out where to start. We are guided. We know where to start. Now, uh, what are the goals of digital health is two things, changing people's in an in, in individual and population lifestyle through digital health, from sedentary to active. That's, everybody understand that. <coughs> the second goal is to also uh, change the way we treat people. So here we treat people by visits. You have an appointment as a, as a clinic and you meet with a, with a patient. That's what we do. We need to add more ways and we need to reduce this and add more things. We need to get people to be involved in their own care. Self-reporting, for example, engagement and, and, and doing things. We say mobile apps, yes, that's fine. Mobile app can actually keep you healthy to some extent. So we need to engage people more than they are engaged today. We need to even engage the community more than they are engaged today. And that's very important because your health is not determined just by you and your phone. We already said we showed that. It is the environment you live in. We show a big percentage of the outcome and determinant of health to rely on that, on that community. Therefore, what is your community resilience? Is it a resilient community? Does it take care of each other, of, of, of its people? So this, the sustainability of community to utilize available resources to respond to understand and recover from adverse situation. Adverse situation includes health of its individuals, in, including the social need, social care need of its individuals, let's say the aging population of a community. So we need to do that. But we also need to do this big picture there. We don't want doctors who graduate to continue doing appointments and seeing patients face to face. They can do that maybe until 2 p.m. After which they can break and then they all go into that room and are treating a lot of patients, maybe 187 patients. 
through the data cases because they have got to trust the data. They have got to action this data and put more meaning to it. This data carry a lot of stuff. So treating people through the, the digital cases, why not? If we are really going to do continuum of care, well, data flying. Now let's utilize it. Otherwise, we're just fooling ourselves, just generating a morass of data and worry about the privacy and talk privacy of data, and we stop there. Uh -uh. You have to sync this data into something. Where are you action it? We need to see doctors that do this. So we need to train our doctors in the medical schools so that we feel more comfortable with data and understand how they could possibly create models to use data to treat patients. So we need to change how we treat patients. We don't want to stop the appointment, the face-to-face, -face, but we need, to, we need to have more ways to deliver the care. Okay, so a practical agenda for digital health, I just put them all in one shot here, is to try to integrate digital health into medicine and health profession. Uh, as we said, to graduate paid doctors that know how to do this. Health navigation, that uh, term which I, I, I heard first uh, from uh, Ramesh, that he coined that term to me, health navigation, give people more. Don't talk health app. Health app is not enough, it's like full navigation. We need to give people a way to live a good, healthy lifestyle. Um, part of that is uh, to increase their engagement. Part of that is also to address the state of the industry. Now you buy apps, and uh, the apps sort of on the company all on your data and are not integrated. You keep buying apps, buying devices. Uh, you feel like you have a morass of things on your phone. You don't really own that. You don't manage it. It's not a good situation. So we need to democratize healthcare, uh, di digital health. Uh, some way, one way or another. One more thing is digital plumbing. This is another sort of uh, uh, approach. Digital plumbing is to start building communities and homes in a different way. Particularly, we need homes that, we, that are smart ready. We don't know what you need. We don't know who's going to buy the home, but at least make it smart ready. So if we want to turn it into something, a dementia home at some point, we can do that easily through prescription. Then that would be a potential future. Finally, we don't want to forget that we can deliver digital health as a service. And I'll talk about this in a second here, but this is an element that's not very cybernetic and not very sensor oriented, but it's very important service. Okay, some successful stories, you find products like uh, uh, the Apple Watch. Uh, these things actually work. Um, they are suspect like in, in, in the quality of data they produce and, and the noisy data stream they have. But uh, Ramesh and I, we, we, we had a, a meeting with uh, uh, Eric Topol uh, because he published a very interesting paper that say that actually short and noisy sequence of data are still good enough if you know how to use the data. So he used representation learning in particular. And his team proved that <coughs> it's good enough for screening. So if you want to screen a whole population for some condition, that's very powerful. That's not population health. Population health is a bit late. Population health is your way to see who dies from lung cancer and create your maps and say, here is population health. Well, pe but people died. What screening does is you are able to create different kind of map, map the more promising and hopeful map. We say, well, the screening map is this. We can save all these lives. So it's very powerful, right? If you are able to screen a huge population, another thing happened. The limited health resources and the limited money you have, you can now put it where it, where it counts, where it's needed. For people who the screening show they are needy of attention, okay? So it's very powerful to, to use these devices. And uh, they seem, from a data point of view, they seem to be very uh, useful. We can use them in a great way. Even though from user interface, we may disagree that they are ready for, for uh, show time. So other example of a successful digital health technology is Propeller Health. This is a company that came up with the simplest idea to put Bluetooth on the, on the jacket of the inhaler. So if anybody inhale, they go to the phone and then go up into a map. So the families, even the doctor, the asthma doctor, wake up in the morning, they drink their cup of coffee in the kitchen, they look at the weather map, they also look at another map they're very interested in, that's their job. They look at how many people have been inhaling and that makes a difference to them. Of, of, of how they deal with their patients. Schools can send advisory, don't bring your children, all that stuff can happen. So it's like sensing the whole crowd and finding out a way to action that sensing. 
This is very successful. It's uh, spreading all over the world. So, so, and again, simple technology, but huge impact. Open notes is very powerful technology, and people don't talk about it because it's just notes, writing notes. But the open notes is what is getting you what you call my chart. You probably know what my chart is because I have seen it in many universities. It, it, it comes from open notes, which is a plug-in in the market marketplace of Epic and other systems. And that's open source. Just please let the patient see what you're writing about, them, for God's sake. Just open it up. So it's a movement, actually, and it's gone a long, long way. So these are all successful stories in digital health. Now let me show you some evidence that digital health works. There is a place called Liverpool in England. And uh, Liverpool is uh, where you have Liverpool Football Club. And they, they're doing really great. They're on the top of the Premier League. And uh, that's probably part of the problem is a lot of people sit down watching football games in Liverpool. <laughs> So you get 30% of the people in Liverpool have living with long-term condition, chronic. You're getting half the population obese. You're getting 86% of the people are not active enough to maintain a healthy condition. 86%. Okay, this is, this is horrible. This is unbelievable. So it's a city, look at this one. So compared to the surrounding areas, the life expectancy of people living in Liverpool is 10 years less. What the heck? This is crazy, right? So uh, that is the perfect place that Philips Healthcare came in and uh, paid all the money to NHS to run a study because they wanted to show it. And they run the study. It's very simple, not even a smart home, just a simple uh, device that connects to the TV, and the TV now becomes the communication platform, and then a bunch of personal health devices and uh, interaction quickly so that the hospital is keeping an eye on you, you're able to see what's happening. And uh, they just ran it for a number of, I think it's almost nine months, and it was a good population. And look what happened. You go here because I almost go there. <laughs> look at this. 60% less paperwork, almost 30% increased patient time, meaning the, the surrounding clinics now have 30% more capacity to see people. 35% uh, less hospital admission. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, well, I'm talking here about COPD. And so it's not for all health, it's like a particular condition. So 35% uh, hospital admission drop, 53% less is half, half reduction in the use of, uh, of uh, the ambulance, the emergency services, and 60% drop in hospital bed days. You cannot beat these statistics. This absolutely works. <laughs> Do you treat a COPD patient by going to the doctor or by putting a couple of devices and a means to communicate back and forth? In this case, it was through a TV. That cause all the, that result in all this improvement. That tells you that tells you how guilty we should feel, how criminal we are by not really applying digital health in a very broad way. We cannot just do research. We cannot just do research. We have got to transform this into something. Okay, it's the slightest thing show you the impact here. Yes. How large was this population group in this study? This is in the 4,000 range. So it's not a... Over one year? Oh, oh, I think nine months. Over nine months. Yeah. yeah. Thank it's you. published. It's a published study. Mm -hmm. the, 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 power the, 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 the power analysis was definitely uh, uh, above the standard. So it was very, very uh, credible results. So that's happening. So I hope that just alone motivates you. But if that is not enough motivation, let's talk money. And if we talk money, we look here at where is the money going to be? If you want to be rich, well, solve health problems for people. This is only mobile health. This is just like mobile health. Mobile health, in 2013, you're talking here about 2.4 billion market. In 2018, it jumped up to 21 billion market. That is a cumulative growth rate. That's just mobile health. But this is the entire spectrum. The entire spectrum includes mobile health, health analytics. It includes Digital health system, you can see it here, like uh, Epic and the uh, decision support system and all that stuff. So the whole spiel, in 2018, totaling 86 billion. In two, 2025, it will jump to half a trillion. That's how big uh, the growth rate is, how, how large the growth rate is. So it's really exciting to see that. So um, money could be the other motive, why we have to create companies and ideas and try to transform things, try to make an impact. 
here is a market uh, uh, indicator. Okay, back to the future now, I start my, my civil lessons. So, uh, seeking a digital health future brighter and better than what we have created, let's look back. The first lesson is known, everybody knows it. Keep it simple and stupid. Well, everybody says that's like, even grandma will tell you that nowadays, right? It's, it's becoming old. So, so what's the idea of this? this is think outside the box, okay, but only to put it in a box. Whatever you're thinking of, it cannot be put in a box, it just throw it away, don't even continue. Think outside the box to put it in a box. If it's not in a box, you're, you're gonna have trouble. So that's the box principle. The idea of the box is to, uh, we have tried many things that we innovate way, way far from the commercialization boundary. And you meet with um, VCs and all that, and I personally have done that, complete disconnect. You've got to invent near the commercialization boundary. That's very important. So putting it in a box, put you close from there, put you right there. So that's one idea. So here's an example of uh, a smart house in Florida, uh, Ramesh mentioned. We had that smart floor. Any, any inch in that house was smart uh, in the floor, meaning we know where the person is, we're able to present all that. And here is uh, one of my victims, uh, Yusuf uh, Kandura, one of my students doing this. <laughs> You should barely get a bunch of papers, but the damn thing is just too much engineering and too much work, right? So that's a smart floor. We're very proud of publish a lot of things. Uh, and the idea is to find out where the person is, to deliver the right, to get the right services up front, and also to count the steps taken. So I know, uh, you know, somebody can know his dad is active today, not active. So you can come up with a scale from one to 10 about activity. It's a very simple thing, but it's, it's a huge, you cannot put it in a box. Whereas smart floor V2, you get these very sensitive MEMS sensor and put them only on walls near power outlets and try to play triangulation. It's basically how fast you can solve linear equations and now you are triangulating and finding things. And uh, also you have noise because of the furniture and all the stuff. So it doesn't take a long time to, to filter out the noise. You're good to go, fantastic. So we moved into this and we decided this can be in a box. Let's work on it. But we got challenged. Um, we even got so ambitious we wanted to estimate the caloric expenditure. Like if you're barely walking or perfectly walking, we felt we can actually measure that. And all that was exciting until we realized um, that we were facing a challenge of the shoe. <coughs> that whatever you're wearing, if you're having socks or no socks, if you're wearing shoes, what kind of shoes, soft shoes, hard shoes, that really messes up, uh, challenges you. It's very difficult to model around these variations. Um, so, so, so be it. Then that is the research. So that's where you need to invent. So be it. That becomes your challenge, and that's where you stay until you get it done. So you have to insist on thinking outside the box to put it in a box. Anything that cannot be put in a box is out. That's the first lesson. Second lesson is, don't give uncertainty a blind eye. You are not writing a cute program for metrics inversion. <laughs> you are creating smart homes and, uh, and systems that involve that very irrational element, the humans. And you have no idea how humans can, can engage in that system. So uncertainty is all over the place. Also, you are not doing systems that run on a Dell server. No, we are putting all these ants they're putting all these sensors. A sensor is not a Dell server. It's a very unreliable component. Okay, so noisy. So you can account for the noise of the sensor, uh, shifted sensor values, missing values. And if you have this sensor even perfect, what do you do with the data? You try to make sense out of sensor data. To make sense, you start having some algorithm, like activity recognition algorithm. Well, errors in the algorithm, low performance value, low accuracy, and all that stuff. Okay, let's even come here. Our perception of the real world, like uh, a researcher is trying to come up with a model for eating breakfast, <laughs> eating breakfast activity. And that, that researcher just think he got it or she got it, but the, there is an accuracy. That's not how people eat breakfast. There are other variations. That's, that's actually a, a filter. You created a filter, not a, a model. So that's a problem. <laughs> Missing activity in the means There are a lot of uncertainty all over the place. So as we build smart homes and as we build these things, uh, like the activity, uh, activity recognition API in Android. 
Google came up with one. Is this perfect, complete? No, it's not. It's got a lot of uncertainty. That's OK, but you cannot ignore the uncertainty. What we're saying here is you're going to live with this uncertainty. Do something about it. Do something. Yeah, that, that's the research agenda. That becomes the research, how to cope with the uncertainty. OK? So uh, this is very important. I'll just show you examples, or two examples, of what uh, my own students did for this. So Yun Chu Kim worked in activity recognition, and she realized uh, this concept of uncertainty, and she researched it to death. She did a great job. And the first thing she noticed is that the, the whole computer science community is still using activity recognition models that were invented over 100 years ago by the social science community, not by the computer science community, which is very simplistic. So she tried to get outside of that fence and, and go crazy, and she got hammered in, in her publication. People rejected many of her publications because it was like, what are you thinking? You know? But she said, the model is missing tools and motion. The model is missing what's called meta activity and operation. These were never part of the standard activity model. So she dared to say that. She struggled, but now she enhanced the semantics of activity. And to, to actually use it, she had to come up with a very weird thing. Even myself, her advisor, was very resistive to it. She said, if we've got uncertainty on the other end, I have an idea. Let's embed the uncertainty from the start. So she would take all the sensors and fuzzify the sensor values and, and, and ship them into the activity recognition system. So I resisted that for a while, but I remember that in operating system, for example, we, we had race conditions. If you, if you recall algorithm for race condition and mutual exclusion, some of the, the banker algorithm, some of these algorithms actually used the venom to cure the system. They used exactly race condition to avoid race condition. So we have had some history in operating system that we use a problem to solve it, solve itself. So I said, okay. So she would classify the sensor value that require knowledge about the sensor and the sensor value range and stuff like that. So she would fuzzify things. Now she has fuzzy values. Um, she take these fuzzy values and she has a, a, the recognition engine that does now different things. It does inference, implication, condition, and so forth. So it's very brand new, very different way of doing recognition. But um, to do all this, now she labels all these states in a probabilistic, uh, let's say, Markov hidden uh, Markov model, hidden Markov model. You don't label the states of any classification. Here she labels into key activity, unique activity, optional activity, exclusive activity, concurrent components. She was able now to label. And, and that allowed her to do the recognition actually in multiple pathways and delay the very final decision of what really happened. She delayed it as much as possible. But the point being is, if you have uncertainty, and she, her experiment was to increase uncertainty and see that she's still saturated, she's bringing the same accuracy. So anything, not that this research is great, anything you need, you, if you want to do a good research in activity recognition in smart home living, for example, do this, please. We need a lot of research here. How do we deal with, the, with the uncertainty? Because you need to build systems that work for people, and they, there's uncertainty, but then how do we operationalize all this? Raja Bose came up with a different approach, which is using virtual sensor. He would use multiple sensors. And uh, with a multiplicity sensor, he's now able to sort of uh, filter out a lot of uncertainty. That was uh, uh, his, his start of research. I just give this all and move to his second level of that, which is phenomena cloud. He realized, OK, virtual sensor is interesting. And he started to label things. He called it sentience abstraction. Okay, like I have sensors. One abstraction is events, great to look at events only. Another is virtual, virtual, like virtual sensor. Phenomena cloud is another abstraction. And he realized, if you don't read sensors, prevent yourself from reading any sensor value. Read phenomena. If you read phenomena, you filter out tons of uncertainty. So this is a tracking, a tracking uh, uh, note. This is a potential candidate. This is a candidate. This is an idle sensor. If you have sensors, let's say the floor, and uh, you are labeling that way, you are able to now know if you have a tracking sensor or not. And if you have multiple tracking nodes, you have more support for the recognition, more confidence. So he used that. And he showed with, with obvious black and white evidence 
There's a big difference. You're filtering almost everything that we dealt with in the smart floor in the, wind, in the smart house in Florida by using, by reading phenomena instead of reading sensors. So fantastic. Okay, well, thank you, Rajan. Rajan now is somewhere in the Bay Area and a big millionaire. I don't know what he's doing. He came up with something. But we need more. We need more of that work of how can we live with an uncertain world but to create something useful. I think that's the lesson I'm trying to share with you here. And I think I spent enough time. I need to roll into something else. These are the rules of transition. He published his work in the ACM transaction on sensor network, so you can, you can read more detail there. Um, okay, we just move on. So uh, to wrap up that lesson, I just have one slide uh, which also provide a big challenge, and I, I don't see anybody working on it. I would love, uh, I would love to see somebody working on it. Which is, if you look at this whole world, devices and sensor, and all that, and data flying, we have established one thing that uh, using raw data is probably not the most useful thing. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Jane himself, he worked on events. How do you actually abstract all this? dynamic and uncertain system into events. Events also give you, uh, get rid of some of the uncertainty. So events, context, activities, behavior, phenomena cloud, and other. We refer to those as sentence abstractions. Let's agree we might have top eight sentence abstractions. We agree these are the most useful ones. Okay, fine, it's great. For mental health, bipolar, all the stuff, you don't want to miss what's called episode detection. Because that's very important, right? Oh, we, we agree we have eight powerful sentence abstractions. And then what is the problem I'm talking about here? What is the challenge? The challenge is this. How can we create a computational structure, smart and intelligent computational structure? You immediately will say, oh, OK, um, uh, 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 graph database. No, don't, not too fast, because that's not going to solve the problem. Something very powerful that allow application developers, let's say you have one application, the application will benefit from raw data. <coughs> application will benefit from some event, from some activity, from some phenomena. You want the application to use all this. Well, the data that's fueling these abstractions is the same, right? So if you, if you try to acquisition all this data on demand, you will end up with a big mess, okay? So there must be a structure that can actually feed and drive all these abstractions. That's within an application. Of course, it also can be within multiple applications. There isn't such a thing at all. I looked at people working in like, uh, languages and compilers, because that might be in their community. This is not touched. So we need to get there. If we agree on a set of powerful census abstraction, here's a question. Find an optimal computational structure that efficiently cater to all of these. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't cater efficiently, guess what? the energy of these devices will just be wiped out. That's the number one. You, you won't be able to sustain. OK, so this is one of the problems we can, we can look at. Let me move out of that lesson into the third lesson. <laughs> Don't develop solution, build a platform that you can use to develop the solution on top of, and that you can uh, that will allow you to change the solution over and over again. Why? Because the same, because we have uncertainty. We don't know even how the user will react and be part of the system. <coughs> we don't know if we got it right. OK, so the first thing is we don't know what we are doing with great certainty. So we had an hygiene application in the Gator Tech Smart House. And we tried to detect bad hygiene, because that's an indication of a particular bacteria called pylori. And the, that pylori thing is like it manifests itself as ulceration, also. And the doctors get confused. The doctor will run all the tests. That's not necessary. If the house is able to politely and privately tell on the, on the resident saying, Mrs. Robinson's hygiene level is 2 out of 10, OK, then the doctor is tipped. So he can suspect pylori, and he give her one pill, one pill, which is, it has some kind of uh, carbon, uh, uh, so, some, some chemicals. And then he tell, do a, a simple test and now make sure that indeed she has a pylori and treat her from that by a simple antibiotic. Done. So we built a smart bathroom to detect hygiene. And then we brought people, we bring people all the time to watch and everything is fine until 
some group came and was like, okay, sir, this is not exactly how old people use bathrooms. <laughs> it's like, okay. And then that hit me, it's like, well, I didn't, I didn't get any formal education about how people use bathrooms. So we're getting ourselves in, in territories. Same thing for kitchen. We can, we are getting ourselves into territories that we really don't have formal education. There is no science behind. So that's, re that's the reason why Lesson 3 is don't develop any solution. Develop a platform on which you can do a solution and keep hammering at it until you get it right. Because most likely you got it wrong. So in fact, I preached this 28 rule, which is if you have money from a funding agency, that's just to do 20% of the thing. And then 80% more money is needed to get it absolutely right. And then it, it is of value. So build a programmable, all-inclusive platform to get things done. But then you can ask, well, what the heck is platform? <laughs> so I will just show you that picture, because I personally worked very hard on that. Um, pediatric asthma, children who are asthmatic. If you try to solve this problem, I already mentioned Propeller Health, if you remember. I mentioned that. There are a bunch of, bunch of apps, all kind of stuff. This is an area where there's a lot of discovery of new devices coming out of the marketplace, very in flux. So if you create a platform, which is a device itself platform, the, the people who connect these devices to each computer and to the cloud, like uh, Professor Sharam, uh, you, you work in this area. This is a whole community. There's a lot of activity there. Uh, and there are best in class are people who have open sources. And then the analytics. And then programming and visualization platform. You want to bring all these people together. You want to bring standard organization also behind the devices. And, and you create a platform that's all inclusive. So if I'm a small company creating a pheno sensor, a sensor that detects the inflammation of the airways, which is a challenging sensor, and everybody's trying. But I, got, I feel I got this right. I'm a small guy, and I start up, and I have this. I can be alone in a bubble, or I can <coughs> bring it immediately in the platform. If I bring it in the platform, it will, the platform authority, per se, will put it on, a, on another platform, make it a device. The clinician here, see there's a new device. They immediately have a quick study because they have access to the patient. In fact, they start studies electronically. And, and the whole ethics form, all that stuff is done. And they can quickly provide input to that small company to get it out of the way, to get it rise up to become something big. You've got to work within platform. Don't ever create <laughs> solutions. Create platforms first. Even if the funding agency fault you for that. Say, well, you didn't get the money for this. You're supposed to do just this. Yes, a question. Can I ask you what those devices are that keep appearing in the slides? OK, so here is mobile apps, which could be anything. Uh, these are uh, simple devices. For example, this is here, uh, the uh, glucose monitor. Uh, what you see here is uh, air pollution. Clarity is an air pollution mm -hmm. monitor. What you see here is um, the propeller health and uh, an inhaler. So uh, nothing really here is like this is the most important device. It's just, uh, you can say, just graphics to show you that there are devices. But there are several, several devices out there for, uh, for asthma. So uh, I have six minutes to finish, to end 50 minutes, right? Uh, so platform is important. We did that in the, in the smart house. We created smart homes as platform, as health platforms. And for that, we had to create actual physical uh, components. We call them the Atlas sensor platform and architecture. So basically, anything in that house that we wanted to be part of the smartness, have, we have to hook it up to one of these nodes. Boom. We hook up that device. From the other end comes a representation for it, which is software. So you're converting hardware to software. That was our platform. And it was very successful. And it did exactly what I learned and what I'm sharing with you. It's a platform. So guess what happened? IBM came on board. IBM was so convinced. IBM labeled me as a dangerous man because I convinced them to do things that are not successful at the end. So they, are, they told me you're a dangerous man. But that's the point. You want to bring people in. And things might work, might not work. So IBM actually moved on to do a SODAS service-oriented device architecture based on Atlas. They believed on it. They held two meetings in the US, one meeting in Europe, and then it died. I don't really know why it died, but it just didn't yeah. fly. But they tried. <laughs> but that, it's about bringing people into a platform for bigger things to happen, bigger than your own project. 
Okay, let me just skip all this. Listen for quickly. Don't overdo it. <laughs> okay. So here's we, in the smart house, we have this uh, microwave oven where the person come close to it, then now it cooks the food and all that stuff. And then we did a study and we were shocked. We felt like, uh, felt like we didn't really do our homework because everybody told us, you know, why keep telling me this? I already know, you already told me. So uh, my friend, Takio Kanadi, he immediately answered when I was sharing with him. I said, ah, you didn't read my paper. I said, which paper, Takio? He said, here, I'll send it to you. He has a formula. Assistance equals goal requirement minus abilities. The point is, don't, if you are trying to assist people, the first order of affair is to inventory their abilities and provide assistance around their ability and over their abilities. Do not discount their abilities. They're not dumb, they're not zombies, they're humans, and they have abilities. The first thing is to respect that ability. You may have to sense it to know what is the boundary of the ability. That's fine, that's challenging, but do that. So that's the lesson is, keep in mind, people are able, no matter what and you cannot assist on the ability zone. And it so changes as well. Right, and it changes over time. Lesson five, make sure it's two-way street. Because we have been doing a lot of sensing and activity recognition, and we try to understand the world. Okay, great, but what do you do in response to that? Okay, so you have to go back to the users. You have to affect, you have to have any influence at all. Influence, net effect of your first direction of traffic. In the second direction of traffic, you need to deliver influences, make them happier. What Ramesh called the guidance of that navigator, right? You need to deliver the guidance. We do less of that, and we shouldn't. We have to bite the bullet. We have to work in this area. It's not an easy area. And here is, uh, I don't want to do this because I don't have time, but uh, uh, my student, Ducky Lee, he was uh, from Korea, and Ducky was a very, uh, devout Catholic, and uh, so he decided, he understood what he needed to do. He told me, I'll be like Jesus Christ. I will, uh, I will take the pain of figuring this out. He went to all <laughs> social science conferences, and he figured it out. And he said, I'm going to create a template to all computer scientists. So if anyone who wants to build an app doesn't have to be an expert in persuasion and engagement, they just follow these steps, and it works. I said, I told him, hallelujah, do it. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, his work was published in Transaction, very nice work, but it lacked some, some elements. But that's how he actually is able to quantify how people are responding to these influences. He's able to quantify the compliance. That is pretty daring, but uh, his work has limit because we did not go in a big, large trial to see how that really works in real time. But I didn't have the chance to, to get NIH funding. I moved to England at that point. Uh, one thing we also noticed, we shared with you, is that it's not all smartphone, it's not all watch. Uh, emotional interfaces go a long way. And the Japanese proved that. And uh, Yamazaki, <laughs> one of our uh, collaborators, we did a study with him in his center. Uh, these things can really go a long way in delivering messages and convincing you. Talk about your body getting out of shape. If you are a woman, you don't want anybody to talk to you about this. But maybe Kevin, the robot, you allow him to do that. <laughs> so, um, Ducky took everything and put it into a mobile version. Uh, it's called Shishero. That's available in open source. If you want to create a mobile app that is persuasive, then you may want to use the Shishero uh, framework. Uh, there are two lessons. I will just uh, spend um, half a minute in one and half a minute in the other. So, so what's that? Health IoT is not IoT. That's the lesson we learn. Don't get carried away that you uh, enter the thing is, is a, you can apply it to health. No, it's very different. It's not just BLE beacons. Um, device interactivity, it's not enough for devices to just API. Any de anything has an API, that's not enough. These devices have to uh, interact and have to interrelate. Let me give you a quick example. If I give you the best glucose monitor that you would use and you're like type one diabetic patient, okay, guess what? You have to know how to use it properly. Part of using properly is to, to have to use it, to interact with it physically in a proper way and in the right context. So you have to use a device two hours after meal. So if I have a smartwatch and the smartwatch is sensing your galvanic response, the smartwatch with a good accuracy tells you if you are eating or not. Now it knows you ate. If you're trying to touch the device five minutes after you ate, 
It shouldn't be used. It should, it should stop you. Okay. Yeah. That will never happen unless these two devices, these two things, mm. have a relationship. Mm. Relationship. Okay. And they're cooperating together. So that's extremely important. The other thing, just let me show it to you here. That device in the market is brilliant devices, and it tips all the research community about this metaphor we have here, the great signal. That's a device where you put your fingers to, to get your ECG. The Apple Watch can do it. This does it a little bit more, or a whole lot more accurately. Okay? But then, you have to press in the right way. How do I know I'm pressing in the right way? So this company, Cardia, came up with a beautiful approach which is a metaphor, great signal. Everybody has a smartphone, they have the signal, how many bars, uh, orange bar or green bar. So you press as you wish, until, and you look it, until you get it right. And now, we don't have noise coming out, we've got real data. Gorgeous, so I love this company, because it just it tipped us. And that all put add requirement over requirement. Uh, so I have my latest PhD student, uh, Wyatt Lindquist, that's his PhD, is how do you create architecture for Health IoT, and we just published a utility. A utility means uh, higher utility from the IoT, not just fancy, not so that everything is connected. I don't care. I want to get utility out of this. So, our utility architecture, we just published it, and I would, uh, I'm definitely uh, uh, sort of excited about this research and about why it is doing an excellent job. And I promise to, I'll skip all these slides just to go into one final lesson, one slide. And that was, um, it's not all sensors and cybernetic. That all said, very simple things. I have been funded heavily to do research on older, older driving, because older people will kill themselves. We'll try to make the car so smart, doing all kinds of stuff. But Uber came, nullified all this research. Any spending, any further spending would be wasteful. Because Jackie can call Uber at one in the morning, go to uh, uh, Lila, play bridge until three, and, 3 in the morning, get drunk, and go home. You can call Uber, call Uber again. What elder driving problem are you talking about? So Uber saw the problem and tipped us. Gah! We can actually think services, for God's sake. We can do better if we figure out how to do service. So it's like crowd, uh, crowdsourcing, crowd sensing services. So can we get a community to care for each other? As I was talking about community resiliency, Yes, we can. If Mr. Robinson can go to um, Mr. Halal to administer a urine sample and get paid seven and a half dollar and uh, take it to the hospital and he's singing and listening to music, but he's still, he's still, he's retiree, but he's still young and he's enjoying and he's a part of the community. What the hell? Why did we not think about it? So people who do service computing, please help yourself. It's wide open. We created the first conference on digital health as a service and we need papers because uh, we, 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 it's very new, so help yourself. Uh, I had, uh, just I want to show you, I have to show you the picture of my team so that uh, I give them credit. This is Emma. Okay, this is Emma we talked about, that's her, the bike. And that's it, I have just flash of what projects are we talking about, but I'll stop here and i just ask you to go to that URL, Digital Health Lancaster. X, Y, Z, for now, it's, it's moving into a school, but we're still finishing it off. So go there, you will see all the projects. Thank you very much. Fantastic. It was, uh, you were even much, much better than I oh, no. knew that you will be. In any case, any questions, please? I have one. So I have a question on the digital health edge on COPD. So I want to know how did uh, digital health actually, like practically help uh, help the the COPD patient? Did the system like uh, remind the patient to take the medication, or did it? Very good question. Do something else. Yeah. Very good question. The, the the softest spot, the softest spot in COPD is what's called readmission. People get uh, discharged from hospital with instructions. Uh -huh. People were going through a dramatic situation, and the nurse and the doctor telling them all kinds of stuff, and even have sheets, and then they go home, they're still tired. It is following the instruction, adhering to instruction properly. Uh, and if they do that, they, there is a chance that they recover and move on. Otherwise, they get readmitted. So readmission is where all these bed, beds are taken, with all the resources are taken. That's a soft spot. So it is just getting the care to be done right. Also, uh, if you have this, let us know. 
how would anybody let me <coughs> talk to the hospital? You're going to be online for 15 minutes. But if you go to that TV and, and click on something, you're telling the hospital, it will go right away. You're not waiting for anyway. So even the way you communicate with the care system is different and is more welcome and actually used. I see. Okay. So I have a question on, uh, you know, in your lesson two, you had this architecture for sentient abstractions. Yes. And uh, it showed sensors as this primary source of data input, and then you had this pipeline where computing was done. But uh, it's also important to have humans in the loop because you want them to self-report their health state. You want them. You want them to do. Uh, you know. You want. You want to actually incorporate that, and that introduces a whole bunch of other issues. So, have you looked at that in how you architect your system in terms of how you have human input in the loop, not only from from individuals, but from healthcare providers, from friends, from family, and so forth. Absolutely. So uh, you have a good point. Uh, I discriminate, and I put all kinds of sensors, and I talk about the noise. And then on, on the one hand, on the other hand, I talk about patient engagement, and they have to do self-reporting engagement. You're right. What I should have done is go back to that array of sensors and devices and plug the person. I should have done that. But it, they would be equal. They will have noise. They will have errors. They are part of the whole thing. But you're right. That's a good eye opener. I should change my, my chart to reflect that reality. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how we might translate this into some form of differentiation for this university. We have a medical center up in Orange that's imagining its way forward. It's got five strategic priorities in a highly competitive market. And you say I will never be a cost leader. We're intending to build a medical center nearby and how all that's going to work. And yet all this research is taking place. And so is this a basis for potential differentiation? I'm new to the organization. I've been here 90 days. I'm the chief information officer for the medical center. We're trying to imagine our way forward. And I see tons of resources here at the university. And I think there's some marriage there. But I absolutely agree. I've seen some of this. But as a way forward, because um, we're, we're the only academic medical center in Orange County. So it seems to me that this is a key basis for differentiation. Do you agree with that? I mean, is that how we can pull this together? I definitely agree with that. How to go about it is the definition of hospital has to change. We talk about changing the delivery. So hospital is the center. But if we imagine what we call it, call them like care spots, you know, uh, smaller hospital centers, this is sort of to spread out the communities, to provide more care in the, in the actual room of the community. Imagine you're creating even more of that. Imagine the, the hospital concept becomes the orbits, comes so close to the homes. Imagine that uh, Alexa, uh, right. Dubai, is actually the hospital. It has a hospital logo on it. The more you entrench the hospital into the community and the more you connect with the community <coughs> with the individual and the more you sort of directly link them up, you'll be able to create chargeable services to the hospitals because we cannot mess with the profitability <coughs> of hospitals. That's something in the US has to be given. You can provide these services by, by embedding the hospital concept into the community. And by doing the embedding, you're simply using all that stuff. You're using the devices, the sensors, and now things are different. So it, it is a way to do it. And uh, the housing industry, the builders, are part of that. So I mentioned the villages in Florida. The villages had a partnership with uh, the University of Florida Health, with Shands. And the uh, press release came in December. 24, right before Christmas, a huge marriage. We're going to create these orbits of hospital all the way entrenched in the community. So it is a partnership between the builders and the new communities. Still, all the community can play in hospital, but the hospital has now to really get liberal and get to uh, get out of that box of just the center. They have to have orbits of care all the way to the where people live. Any other questions for Sumi? Well, with, with the Alexa or, uh, or Google, um, you know, if a, if a person's doing a, a household activity like washing dishes, they can just, it should be able to tell them, I'm starting to wash dishes, and then 15 minutes later, I'm done washing dishes, uh, in order to record what they were doing. I mean, they don't do that right now, but obviously. 
I mean, voice recognition is really good now, so um, that, you know, along with all the Apple Watch, which watches your steps and measures your heart rate to tell you how much energy you're generating, things like that. But you can also talk to this continuous thing. Right. Some dementia research actually delights us with, with a challenge that the person may forget to, to manifest, to say what they're doing, to, to, to log what they're doing. Sure. Yeah, but it's different. Any input that can help would be great. The, 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 the highest standard is to use least number of sensors, reliable sensors, to achieve the recognition. So the, this research that came out of the University of Washington was brilliant using the water pipe, the, 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 main, the main coming in. By just listening acoustically to all kind of noise, you actually know the person is in the bathroom, the person in the kitchen, the person is doing this. Mm -hmm. They are able to know a lot with one sensor, and that sensor is very cheap. And then that's our hat off to that researcher who came up with that idea, because the golden standard is to get cheapest, minimum number of sensors that are reliable to give you accurate information. Uh, along that direct and Sumi, uh, you thought something about <coughs> robots. And one of the very interesting things that uh, people sometimes talk is that robots could be amazing companion for senior people, but particularly because the senior people feel very lonely and all this kind of thing. Uh, people have even started exploring or a, a, at least talk about uh, designing a pet robot that could be staying in the home and it is also for, uh, observing Oh, there is a dangerous condition. This has to be removed, for uh, otherwise the person is going to fall Absolutely. Uh, and become a companion. Yes. Uh, I have seen these concepts in uh, kind of uh, futuristic way. Is there anybody working on this kind of thing? So the, the Koreans are working heavily on this, and the Japanese. Uh, a president. But Japanese Aibo is uh, the. The Aibo robot is very self-contained. It, it costs you ten thousand yes. dollars, and uh, uh, you cannot do much with that. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I don't know how to get the picture, but there was a report called Pepero. Pepero. Pepero was done by NEC in oh, Japan, okay. Okay. and NEC didn't eventually didn't put it in the don't market. Don't worry about the picture. We okay. find out that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is Pepero right there. Uh -huh. Okay, it's very cheap. It doesn't have a lot of mobility, but it actually can smile, can frown, and can get uh, bashful, can be a red uh, cheeks. It's able to express emotion, but it's and it's very cheap. No? But it's autistic in a sense that it's not connected to, to the rest. Right. right. It's, it is, it's simple, but it has that emotional interface. And it, it's very limited. It was targeted for cheap prices. It's like you, if you go to the Dell, you'll find servers, you find PCs, you find laptops. So the vision was, you'll find a robot, a home robot. And the Koreans and the Japanese wanted to fill that space quickly. So they worked on it heavily. These are cheap, so that, that is expensive stuff. So that is Aldebaran. Right. You, I, I had Aldebaran and I have this Yujin from Korea. That's a Korean robot. Mm -hmm. And we, we played with them. They make a difference. But we, we, we needed, you cannot get a prototype robot to do an efficacy and uh, study to see if people like it. It's just impossible. So you got to check in the neck. We have been waiting, for example. I've been begging NEC to send me these to my lab. They don't want to send it. We're going <coughs> to put it in the market. Wait. But if they put it in the market, we would have really uh, answered your question. We would have put it to test, see if it really works or not. And that never happened yet. But I know that the Korean and the Japanese are not letting in. They're still trying hard on that. Well, they started with the social robotics concept in Japan 20 years ago. Yes. Uh, Tamaguchi was the first very simple robot. Yes. And uh, in my opinion, lots of uh, senior living problems could be solved using this. Indeed. Social isolation is one big problem mm -hmm. that can be solved. Uh, the Japanese have cats and dogs that, uh, that take the specific you know, pet for. To me, I was wondering, in your experience, how, how far is the progress now in the kind of sensor composition, in the, in the way of the abstract, how can we create these abstractions of these virtual sensors, or whatever you call it, into more and more complex configurations that can be manipulated by a platform? Yes. Is that something that is just, you know, can that be automated? Is that... Uh, what is the current state in your opinion? I think there, 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 is, there is severe shortage of that research. 
that research, uh, to give you just a few, a few of the elements, is comp there is computational structure that needs to be then done, and that should span heterogeneous elements, meaning yeah. that structure should be on the devices, but also on the edge, and also on the cloud. Exactly, exactly. Heterogeneous. Exactly. How can you get that structure to work optimal? It's very difficult. Nobody's touching this. Right, right, right. We know events. We have done a lot of events. Uh, Professor Jane himself worked on events. Uh, activity is there, but there are more abstractions. If you try to do them individually, no cigar. You have to do it simultaneously. Nobody dares to do them simultaneously. It's difficult. It's not just simple compiler code optimization, code generation optimization problem. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be addressed. Uh, I, don't, I personally didn't see much work. I am dying to see work in this area. Because the moment this happened, the moment we can say, okay, here is a whole new home kit for Apple, a new home kit for Google. So you put all the stuff in your home, and here is a, a nice development environment for developers. And now developers will develop really powerful application that doesn't drain your devices and that work perfectly. We don't have that mediation yet. It's a very important area of research. <coughs> so to my knowledge, it's mm -hmm. stalled. So um, <coughs> the current project example for the our uh, project for the purpose of that uh, is uh, two medical devices, uh, which is pacemaker and also art artificial pancreas. So, uh, based on the limited like um, data we can access, always like we can make some uh, improvement from like uh, the alt model. For example, like prediction of the like, glucose uh, status or something. So that's uh, that's uh, we we can believe that that's kind of like get some improvement, but. Like lack of that kind of the real data that we can access, always like <coughs> stuck at that point. We're stuck at that point like, okay. So we're not sure about like, this could be like safe or, you know, usable for like real usage, for example. So kind of like uh, blocked in at the point that, that, you know, that academia level or, you know, industry level. Like. Right. So we, right. we have challenges of that. So. Yeah. If center can like give us a chance to like access the data uh, from like real data, with, which definitely like you know guarantees some privacy issues, like that might be really nice. Yeah, very really excellent question. Uh, FDA itself is struggling with that question. They have this classification of wellness app. Mm -hmm. Okay, really clear. Oh, it's wellness. So wellness, there are you put you in a box. You cannot do anything. You do all this, and it's not important if you're doing it right or you are doing it wrong. You don't have to provide a lot of evidence on the wellness part, which is ironic. <laughs> we, we already agreed that it starts with wellness, then yes. every, well, the big problem will not happen. So it's like ignored, it's like a, just a broad brush thing. But the medical thing is where you have to provide studies and evidence, a lot of evidence, and FDA has to have to apply a lot of processes to achieve. So to, to go back to your origin, origin of your question, it's like, you know, what can we do with this? That's perfectly the same thing that we talked about with screening. Uh, Eric Tobel said, yes, noisy and short sequences can go a long way in just screening. So it depends what you want to do with it. If you're going to do something where you're going to inject yourself with the medicine, that's maybe harsh. But maybe we will get you to go to the doctors and jump the queue and see the doctor immediately, for example, and that doesn't kill anybody. And then the medical processes take over, and now we've made a perfect use of it. So it's what you do with the data. Okay, what you do with the data. So it's not important the quality of the data uh, given limits. You have limits of what you can uh, achieve with data. But if you are able to put the spin the best use out of it, that's really what matters. Okay, I think uh, uh, in the interest of time, we have to stop here soon. The, the discussion is very interesting and we could continue it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.